Welcome to In It to Win It. This is Steve Barton, and thank you for tuning in. And thank you for allowing us to do work that we find meaningful. Thank you for giving us the most valuable commodity you have, your attention. We promise to do our very best to give you a return on it. Today we have Jerry Robinson of followthemoney.com on the show. Jerry is an investor and speculator. He's a host at Silver Chartist and has been trading stocks for decades. Today, we're gonna pick his brain. Jerry, thank you for coming on the show. It's great to be here, Steve. Thanks for the invite. Yes, sir. The pleasure's all on this side of the table. Uh, I've, uh, I've been looking forward to this one. Um, this is your first time on the show, so go ahead and give us a couple minutes on your background and how that led to where you are today. Sure, I, I had an er interest in the stock market early on. Um, my mother was a stockbroker when I was young. I was in, I think I was in middle school. She was studying for the Series 7, and I was helping her study, and I began to be interested, ironically, in uh, the market. So I began watching the market from an early age, began reading investing books, was constantly trying to figure out how to crack the code on Wall Street, so to speak, from an early age. And uh, over time, realized that, you know, position trading – uh, for me was good. And, you know, dollar cost average long term investing into high quality assets also worked really well. And so that's what I've done now in 2010. See, I started I traded my first stock in 1996. I traded my first option in 2002. And then I bought my first uh, bought Bitcoin for the first time in 2013. So I, I've had a kind of a, you know, a, a fairly decent amount of time in the market. And in 2010, uh, we uh, launched followthemoney.com, which is where we coach and educate traders and investors and income seekers on how to, you know, uh, get their finances in good shape and uh, grow grow their wealth. So, um, and today uh, I'm I'm simply an educator and an investor. I, I wrote a book called Bankruptcy of Our Nation, and uh, yeah, that's that's what I do today. So thanks thanks for asking. Yeah, it. Uh, so it, when you say early age and you place your first stock trade in '96, were you like uh, 15 or, or 20? Or yeah, '96. Uh, I was uh, I was 20 years old at the time. Yep, okay. I just had my first my first corporate job, and I was finally getting into the you know the concept of uh, really taking it on. I wish I had started investing early. I I started educating myself early, but I didn't take the leap until I was about 20 years old. Oh, you probably had a pretty good mentor with your mom being a stockbroker. That's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, that was pretty neat. Pretty neat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. What uh, macro view? Uh, what is your macro view of the world economy and financial markets as it sits today? Well, as it sits today, uh, obviously, we're seeing things improve as we have the recovery. And the United States has been one of the best markets, the, the, the best, uh, you know, developed market to come out of the uh, the COVID uh, situation and the supply chain constraints and the inflation and all the things that we've had to deal with over the last several years. So in the near term, we're seeing a recovery. Um, obviously, longer term, as I mentioned, I wrote a book called Bankruptcy of Our Nation that was published back in 2000. And, uh, I wrote the book back in 2007. It came out in 2009. The revised and updated edition was put out in 2012. That book really just explains the hardcore realities, the hard facts that uh, longer term, you know, my macro view is not nearly as, as bright. Uh, in the near term, I think we can continue to kick the can down the road, but we are facing massive unfunded liabilities. We're facing a national debt, of course, and it's not just here in the United States. The whole world is over leveraged. So the debt problem is a big problem. Uh, I think it's incumbent upon investors to factor that in into their longer term views. But at the same time, we don't let it stop us from investing. We don't let it make us, you know, that we don't allow it to, to uh, derail our investing plans because the world is in a wash in debt. I mean, we can't put our money into a, you know, glass jar and bury it, we have to do something with it. So we do need to have a strategy. But, uh, but, but in the near term, uh, you know, I'm I'm somewhat positive on uh, several trends. I think uh, I'm a big, you know, tech investor. I I, I do believe that technology uh, tends to surprise. Um, when you think back, for example, to the time of the Great Depression, uh, as a student of economic history, I think back to the time of the uh, of the Great Depression in the 1930s. And what many people don't know is that, at least I didn't know this until I went back and studied it, but, you know, uh, 
the, the amount of technology and technological innovation that was occurring, even in the depths of the depression, um, was simply astonishing. And I think what we've seen recently is this new information revolution where we're in a new quote unquote industrial revolution that's really centered around information. And I, I have very high hopes for uh, artificial intelligence, for, um, you know, for generative AI. I have high hopes for uh, companies like uh, NVIDIA, which I own. You know, I, have, I have a lot of uh, conviction, I think, in the tech space, which can also dr drive down uh, inflation, and it even serves as a deflationary force. So, you know, it remains to be seen how it's all going to play out. But, um, you know, near term, you know, a uh, fairly mild view, longer term, macro view, very concerned. Okay. All right. So short term, you see uh, uh, the U.S. has recovered out of out of everyone the best uh, in recovery to COVID. But long term, and you felt so strongly about it, you even wrote a book uh, right. that the debt that we're accumulating over time and passing on to our grandchildren is eventually not going to be a can that we can continue to kick down the road. Um, yeah. But what's interesting here, and one thing that I know very little about, is the tech sector. And I understand what you're saying about the uh, deflationary impulse of it, in that if something, if you can have a robot flip burgers at McDonald's, your cost has gone down a lot, and, and uh, that fast food might actually get cheaper because of technology and AI, not more expensive. It, that's exactly right. That's exactly what happens. And so... And of course, there are ramifications and unintended consequences with that, of course, in the terms of, you know, jobs that might be lost. Um, there's two ways to view that. One is, you know, to panic. Uh, the other is to, to realize that this is going to lead to a shift in our economy. And I think that's the proper way to look at it. We tend to uh, we tend to enter, enter these phases um, with a lot of fear. We think back, for example, with the adoption of, of electricity. You know, when you when you see the adoption of electricity many uh, year or a century ago or more, uh, you know the, the the view was was that well, you know, this is just a fad, um, and you know, lighting up a building is one thing, but we're not going to put electricity in our homes; it'll burn them down. You know, uh, so there was a great hesitancy to have a, electricity run into people's homes for the fear that it was going to burn them down, and this was a massive fear. Um, that slowly but surely dissipated, and re we realized, okay, that's not a real fear. The same thing with with vehicles and with cars. I mean, cars are, you know, vehicles and automobiles are one of the leading causes of, of death still. Uh, but at the same time, there was a fear that it was going to be much, much, much higher. Uh, and people said, I'm sticking with my horse and buggy. You know, I'm not going to be driving these death machines. Well, over time, of course, people kind of wilted that, that they their their uh, their obstinance wilted. And they finally, you know, adopted uh, vehicles. And so, you know, I, I think it's the same thing with AI and, and many of these other things. And all of these other things worked out. You know, the, 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 uh, the horse and buggy uh, driver figured out a way to make money. You know, uh, it, 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 there was a way for him forward with electricity that the displaced workers found a, a new way forward. I think we'll figure it out. But uh, you're right. There is a de deflationary impulse with technology. And I think that uh, that, that actually bodes well for us. Because we are, you know, in such a, a an economy that's so awash in debt and therefore inflationary by definition. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's see. On on the tech sector, um, as far as a horizon on that, uh, you kind of gave your overview there. Now, what about current like valuations? Is this when I look at a chart of Nvidia? I mean, it right when you think it can't keep going, it just does. You know, are are we in a bubble? Like, is this a crowded space? Is there even the supply demand dynamics for all these chips that that are are going to change the world? What uh, what what are your thoughts on that? I was fortunate to buy Nvidia before the big run, and so I've seen it, I've watched it, and it's been a little bit. Of course, it's been exhilarating, but it's also uh, been a little unnerving. Uh, you don't like to see anything go straight up, and I do believe it's due for a pullback. However, when you look at the forward P.E. ratio, for example, you'll see that it's actually lower than it actually has been for some time. And the reason is, is because the earnings have just risen so dramatically that it's just dragged down. Uh, you know, it's kind of dragged down that 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 metric. So I think overall, the the acceleration of the earnings has been such that it has 
not really caused this stock to really be in a bubble per se. I know that if you're looking outside and just seeing what's happened to it, it's easy to imagine, well, this looks like a bubble. And for, for all intents and purposes, you know, it's possible that we could see a, a sizable correction in the price in the near term. But I think the price is justified. And I think that the demand is going to remain strong. NVIDIA was one that I had a early on had a strong conviction on. It was a kind of a conviction buy, and it's been one that I just DCA into. I ramped up that DCA in 2022 on Follow the Money. I started telling our members, look, you know, this is my year to to really go in deeper on on NVIDIA because NVIDIA was really beaten down. People were saying it was, you know, dead or it was over. You know, NVIDIA nice really, catch. That was well, a good run. <laughs> it, it, you know, it, had I, but had I not been watching it and had I not really had it, because again, it's one thing to look at something and be like, well, you know, and just kind of buy what the crowd says. But if you have conviction on it and if you've done your due diligence, it, it can work out. It doesn't always work out. In fact, I've had, you know, I've had conviction on other things that didn't do so well, you know, so, so it's, it's kind of, you know, so you, you never really know. But, but I think with NVIDIA, it's really worked out. And I, I do think even with the run, uh, it's not I, I the only reason I'm not adding to it right now is because I I don't really want to drag my overall cost basis up, quite frankly. I would rather wait for a pullback because it's a long term 20 plus year hold for me. It's not a it's not a trade. So I would prefer to buy on the pullbacks going forward. But uh, but again, I, I probably was I wouldn't hesitate to add here personally. I don't know what people are watching should do. They need to do their own due diligence, of course. I'm not a financial advisor. And they should always talk to a trusted financial advisor before they make any investment decisions. But for me, you know, I'm not as scared of the price here. I just don't want to drag up my cost basis. Okay. Okay. What do you see with um, AMD, Advanced Micro Devices, when I just looked at their, I, I don't know what their forward earnings uh, are looking like or what people are guessing they're going to be. But I mean, their price to earnings, I think was 400 or something. Yeah, uh, AMD, I think, also has a nice runway. I think that this one is also a very good one. Um, I don't own it. I think that that one is a little bit ahead of, its, ahead of itself on the forward P. I don't know it off the top of my head either because I don't own it. But I remember when I did an analysis about a month ago, I noticed that NVIDIA's was, was dramatically lower compared to, say, Intel or compared to AMD. Uh, these companies, I think, on pullbacks would be very attractive to look at. Um, but I do think that some of them have got ahead of themselves in particular, AMD. Uh, I think they have a great story. I think they have, a, but they have a huge, huge, uh, competitor in NVIDIA. NVIDIA is this 800 pound gorilla. It's really kind of got the, it's kind of the pick and shovels play of AI. Um, and I think this is a long road ahead. So AM, I think there's room for AMD, of course, but I think you're right. I think those, those companies, that don't have such the huge dramatic increase in earnings that we've seen in Nvidia, you know, they are running a little hot, perhaps, in my opinion. Okay. What what is the most uh bubble territory overbought uh crowded tech stock right now? Well, you could build the case that uh Apple is a little expensive. Now, Apple is one I own for the long run, too. I think that perhaps it based upon its earnings and, and revenues, uh, merely looking at growth, I would say that one's probably a little top heavy. There's a lot of concern around Google uh, because of the fact that it kind of botched its rollout of Gemini, uh, of its AI tool. I think that Google um, has all the data. So Google is one that I own, but G Google is, uh, you know, it's one of these companies that uh, has, has so many things going for it but you just don't know what's going to happen. So it's to me, Google is a tough one to, to figure out. Uh, as far as more bubbles, um, you know, I hate to mention individual stocks uh, that they're, you know, the, the communication sector in general has been pretty hot for quite a long time. Uh, some of the more beaten down spaces, maybe we could look at that too, would be things like uh, real estate and uh, utilities. Uh, some of these stocks in the utility space and in the real estate space they're beaten down, but they're beaten down for a real specific reason. And so to me, it actually makes a lot of sense to perhaps if you're someone who's kind of a bottom feeder or you're looking for those areas or market sectors of the market that have really been beat down, you would look to something like real estate or utilities. And the reason why they're down is because of interest rates. 
uh, if you can go put your money in the bank and earn a 5% on a CD, well, that takes the thunder out of a utility stock, which is pretty dry and boring and pays maybe less than the 5% uh, CD rate. Or uh, people who invest in REITs, people are scared around commercial real estate right now, and they're worried about, and so a lot of them are not in the market. You know, it's really about seven or six to eight trillion dollars on the sidelines right now in money markets and um wow i think a lot of a lot of that money is going to come back into the market uh and i would imagine that much of it will flow to income you know income rich sectors so i think there's you know there's a thing to be said that we will see uh, a broadening out of the market over time and i think some of these beaten down sectors like consumer staples and and uh, real estate and utilities could be beneficiaries of that. I mean, obviously, money will flow into tech, too, of course. I don't think that's going to go away. But, but I think there are some opportunities in the market, even though a lot of it looks, you know, even though we're at all-time highs and even though tech has had this huge run, there's, you know, the, the market's composed of 11 sectors, not one. So, you know, there's always opportunity somewhere. There's always a bull market somewhere, as they say. Yeah, okay, okay. Or an, so... opportun- or an opportunity, you know, somewhere. Yeah, so you see uh, Apple, Google maybe kind of getting a little bit uh, high, but uh, if there's a general um, area that uh, that you think might be pretty overbought, it's uh, communications. Yeah, yeah, perhaps, yeah, per- communications. And let me also add, um, you know, I, I think another one that's, that's really gone up pretty big is uh, uh, Eli Lilly, you know, for example, Ozempic, the, uh, the, the weight loss drugs, you know, I'm a huge fan of Eli Lilly. I mean, what a great stock. I, I wish I would have bought that one. I knew about it early and I just didn't I didn't buy it. But I think some of those stocks too may be a little hyped up. Um, but yeah, and then I would s- stress, let me just add one thing about Apple. Again, I'm a long-term in- Apple investor, but I don't, I'm not uh, saying that anybody should short it or anything like that. What I'm saying is, is that I think it's a little, it's a little toppy right now. And it's come down a little bit since uh, you know, over the last few weeks. In June, there's going to be the WWDC. Uh, it's the big worldwide uh, uh, the developer conference that they put on. And I think this is the year where Apple is really going to go deeper into AI. They recently cut their uh, their Project Titan, their, their electric vehicle that they have been working on for, I guess, a decade. Um, they cut that, and they just recently announced that. And, you know, trying to come up with an electric vehicle – is probably the most hardest nut to crack in artificial intelligence, a self-driving autonomous vehicle. That's one of the toughest, that's one of the toughest problems to fit, to figure out. And so they, they have a, a brain trust that's been working on one of the toughest things and they just recently ended it. And now they're migrating these people that they've been working on that project into other projects. Huh. And if you, if you've seen the vision pro, for example, put out by Apple, the spatial computing that Apple is doing, it is just simply mind blowing. So I am a, I am long on Apple, but I think right now that they have been the they have been one of the companies that has been they've been really bid up um, and they've been near all time highs, but they haven't come out in their earnings call and talked about AI, AI, AI. And the companies that have have seen their company you know their prices go up. Apple uh, hasn't really done that. I think we're going to see Apple move more into the AI space. Um, publicly and begin talking about it more later this year, I think that bodes well for the stock. So I'm not saying that I think the stock is going to go down. I just think that there's probably been a little bit too much enthusiasm around some of these companies and they may be due for a pullback, you know, and I think Apple's getting it right now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. There seems to be a little support around like 160 or so. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay. uh, Let's move on to, um, can you uh, pull up the gold chart? Oh yeah, absolutely. Let's get let's take a look at gold. You bet. There we go. That's gold. That's gold, sure enough. Okay, so let's talk about this chart. Um, let me get my pen here so we can draw on it. Uh, I can kind of point out some different things. Uh, there we go. Okay, now, um, so first of all, as we can see in this particular chart, you know, gold is looking really good. We just had this nice breakout above the twenty one hundred level. This had served as big resistance for some time. We first hit this 2100 level back in 2020 and amidst the uh, COVID situation, had that big, really nice spike on decent volume, but it hit that area, pulled back, 
then tried it again and failed again in 2022, came back down, touched its 200 weekly moving average, which is a really key support area, came back up to 2100, failed again. And then we came back, touched that 200 weekly, and then we came up again and failed again, uh, and then just consolidated and then recently broke out. Now, if, if this candle holds for the week, then this is going to be really big for gold. Uh, so gold has really been in what we would call an ascending triangle. You can kind of see that it has a flat ceiling there, and then it has this ascending kind of uh, look to it. Yeah. So lower, uh, higher lows, and then kind of the ceiling on the top. But we just broke out. And I think that really bodes well, you know, for uh, gold going forward. Uh, we've been long, you know, we've been long gold for a long time. I like physical gold. I don't really invest in the miners. I, I've invest in the physical metal itself. And I really like, uh, a, you know, gold as a, as a hedge. Uh, I certainly don't put too much into it. It's just a small, you know, it's a re relatively small allocation for me, but I think it's a, it's a good place to be if you're concerned about the banking system, if you're concerned about, you know, those unfunded obligations we had talked about. I think it's a, you know, I think it's a fine market for that, but we're definitely seeing it break out. And what's nice about that is that the dollar has yet to really break down. Um, it's certainly off of its highs that we saw back in 2022, but it's definitely not uh, breaking down the way we expect it to with the advent of rate hikes, uh, or I'm sorry, rate cuts, scratch that rate cuts. And so as, as, uh, as rate rates fall, well, that's going to cause the dollar to fall. And as the dollar goes down, well, we obviously know that's that's good news for hard assets, things denominated in dollars. And so uh, so gold, we think, is going to do even better uh, as the dollar begins to fall, perhaps later this year, uh, in the wake of those rate cuts as they eventually come. So it's good to see gold already breaking out to a new all time high without that dollar as serving as a tailwind. Yeah. Can you uh, switch over to the daily? Yeah, let me br let me get a daily here. I have a daily. There's also uh, this is a daily chart here, I believe. Let me double check. Yes, this is a daily here. So this yeah. is a daily that goes back for some time, and you can see this has a 100 SMA. This is the 100 simple moving average. I like to use this on gold because it it really does work. Not not every uh, asset works with a 100 day, but with this with gold, it really does. When it breaks out, it's usually pretty meaningful. It'll, it'll break out and then backfill, and that's usually a really good sign. And there we yeah. can see it tested that area again. Then it came down, and then in 2023, we had this little bit of a funk where it was just really not doing anything at all. But then it broke out again on higher than normal volume last October, backfilled like we had hoped, and then took off. It recently touched it again right before it broke out to its new all-time high on that bigger than normal volume. Yeah. So that, again, suggested that this rally has legs. That that daily chart looks pretty good. You know, you can really see the nice bullish channel. You know that it's operating in there. Yeah, and where each daily candle there going off uh, to the end of the screen is is a little. Um, uh, it just keeps uh, clicking higher. But if you look back yes. when it when it touched up into the twenty one hundreds, it was for a hot minute. You know, it was it was yes. just traders going back and forth. But this is like just substantial, consistent buying. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, you can see that fake out right there, you know, where it came up and it had a long wick. Yeah. You've also got to watch out for those long wicks, too, that resolve that way, because those often portend, uh, you know, a, uh, a rejection of higher prices and you'll often consolidate for some time. You got a long wick there as well, that long wick, and then it pulls back and consolidates, you know. So watch out for those long wicks on the top. And then if you see a long wick on the bottom, Oftentimes it'll signal that you're you're going to get some upside action. Not always. There's no there's no uh, you know silver bullet in in technical analysis, but that's something I've certainly noticed. Oh yeah, yeah, we love those long wicks on the bottom. Those are fun. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Usually means money's coming. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Got it. Uh, all right, uh, let's move on to uh, silver. If you could pull up the the silver. weekly on uh, silver. Yes, yeah, so I've got a weekly chart here on silver. Let me pull that one up as well. That's a that's a good one to talk about. Uh, and in fact, this is actually, I have a monthly chart. Maybe we'll start with, and then okay. I'll get the, then I'll get the, uh, weekly as well. Let me see here. Oh, you know what? I'm going to hide the video panel here for just a sec so that, uh, make sure it's not covering up the viewers. Oh, sure. Yeah. In fact, 
we'll do it. We'll do it with the weekly first because I think that that tells the story better. Okay, so here we have the weekly chart on silver. On silver, you can see we've really done a whole lot of nothing since 2021. I mean, it's a it's been a really big consolidation, and we'll see this on the uh, monthly chart in just a minute. But you can see the price action has really just been kind of stagnant, and it's really been you know just consolidating. Uh, right around, though, a rising 200 weekly moving average. That's a really important moving average for technical analysis. When you move it to a weekly chart and then just you know leave a 200, it'll change it from a 200 daily to a 200 weekly. And the 200 weekly is a really powerful uh, uh, metric on the weekly chart. And you'll see that it you know kind of acts around. It kind of does some interesting things around it. It'll serve as resistance. It'll serve, uh, ref, uh, serve as support. Uh, lately, uh, it's been kind of just tightening around that area but the 200 weekly is rising now the problem with silver here is that uh you know it's facing a lot of resistance so as we do this recording right now silver is sitting at about 2456 well that's right here where this big resistance is 2450 for us has been yep. a major major area and once we take that out we're not out of the woods because once we get above that and we really want to see a nice volume uh, you know, nice big volume breakout above 2450. But then we're going to have this massive 26 to $27 range, which has served again as just that same kind of similar to that 2100 level on gold, not the same exactly, but similar in its resistance. And so 26 to $27 breakout for silver is what we're watching for. And then when we when we look at um, when we look at, say, let me change this here. When we look at, say, uh, the monthly chart, now you'll really see what we're seeing here on silver, and that is that we have a uh, – let me see. Let me change that to the drawing tool so I can draw on this. There we go. Uh, so as you can see here, we're waiting for this multi-year breakout. I mean, look at this triangle going yeah. back to – this is a 15-year chart at least. And you'll see here that we did peak out at around 50 bucks back in 2011. That was a really nice run we had. But then we've been trading below that level ever since. We came down and got stuck in this range for quite a long time. We broke out of that in COVID, and we've been kind of sticking to this higher line here, to this uh, area right here where we have this kind of symmetrical triangle. We've been knocking at this door now for quite some time, for years, quite frankly, and we're really consolidating right up here in this area. So... What we're looking for is a breakout above this area as well. So we're talking $26, $27 on silver. And I think once we see that, that means that we're really, really getting serious. Then I think it's just a matter of, of time before we break out to very likely, you know, a, a new all-time high. I think 50 is not out of the realm of reason for silver. I don't – I think silver is probably one of the most volatile commodities I've ever seen. Um, and so it can't, it can really surprise you. The thing is too, is that it'll, it often runs. And then it, when it runs, it'll often run and then turn right back around. So you've yeah. got to be quick. It's a, it's a speculative commodity for sure. It's not, you know, it's not really, it's not like gold in my opinion, where it's more like insurance. Uh, silver is a lot more volatile, you know? It's a lot of fun to trade though, right? I, oh, I yeah, ran an option on uh, SILJ the other day. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> yes, Absolutely. <laughs> Yes. All right. Uh, can you pull up the uranium chart? Yeah, let's do uranium. In fact, I'll just type in, uh, let's do this here, a uranium ETF. That'll probably be just as easy. URA? Yeah, we can use URA if that's what you like. Sure. Yeah, that one's yeah. got the most history. I like URNM better, but, it, you know, it's too new. It, it really is too new. So you can really kind of see here what's been happening. This is a monthly chart. We'll, we'll change here in just a minute. We look at the monthly chart. And we can really see that uranium prices had come down. They bottomed out back in that, uh, again, the COVID era. And then things started moving higher for uh, uranium. And we've been seeing it rise ever since the COVID lows. Now, what's interesting about uranium and uranium miners, and by the way, this is not the spot price for uranium. This is the Global X Uranium ETF, as you were pointing out. Notice the volume here that really got the interest came uh, on the, on the uh, other side of COVID. You know, one thing to keep in mind about your, uh, uranium is that you know, it is a clean fuel. And so, too, uh, you have guys like Sam Altman who run OpenAI Open AI, who are strongly advocating and even investing big time. Uh, like there's a company, I think it's called Okla, 
uh, that is operating, I want to say in Ohio. But uh, what they're doing is, is that, you know, if you're going to have these super powered computers running generative AI and these GPUs, it's going to take a lot of, uh, of energy. Yeah. Uh, same thing for Bitcoin mining and all of this. I mean, the world really needs a lot of electricity. And so uh, to power that, you know, you only have a few options if you're looking at clean energy, solar, of course, and wind. But those are also controversial. Uranium is controversial, too. But we're beginning we're really beginning to see a lot of uh, very deep pocketed individuals realize that uranium is one of the best sources for clean energy. Uh, energy. And so um, I think uranium probably has a very good run uh, ahead. It's already had a nice run. 2023, we really saw a great year for uranium. Uh, we track we track uh, URA. We actually changed it to URNM uh, not too long ago, but we track that in our ETF leaderboard. So at Follow the Money, we have an ETF leaderboard where we track 150 different markets. And uranium was consistently near the top of our rankings throughout 2023. It had a great year. Uh, a lot of our members were able to ride that. Uh, it's backed off recently, but I think that's probably going to be temporary because the demand, I think, is going to continue rising. So there's a monthly chart, as you can see. We can change it to a weekly and kind of get an idea, a little bit more nitty-gritty of what's been happening. Maybe we'll change this to, say, about five about five years or so. And you can really see you know, what's happened. Uh, that COVID low uh, you know, with, with your URA was down near what, six bucks, right? Yeah. It's really rallied nice. And then we consolidated through 2022. It didn't come down as much as some of the other markets in 2022. 2022 was brutal for many stocks, but uranium kind of held its own. And then in 2023, it really began to resume its march higher. So again, we we're pretty bullish on uranium. It, it certainly looks bullish on the charts. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and how about natural gas? You know, I have a natural gas chart I thought I wanted to share. Let me pull this one up. This one's a really interesting chart um, because, and natural gas was actually a market that I used to specialize in uh, way back, I guess it was probably in 2008. Perfect. I worked, I worked for a, yeah, it was a very, <laughs> it was a very interesting time. Uh, You're the guy to ask then. <laughs> right. Yeah, it was a wild time. And I actually had the opportunity to work on a uh, oil and gas trading floor. And it was a really neat experience. But 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 uh, natural gas was really the, the main enchilada there. And so I followed that market for many years. Uh, I don't trade it anymore, but I did alert our members not too long ago to the fact that it did. Natural gas recently did something that we haven't seen in a long time. Um, and that is it came back down to this dollar 50 level right here and that that level is actually where we hit back in the covid lows mm -hmm. and it's also where we hit back in 2016 now, now i did trade this one here the 2016 low when we hit a dollar 50 i sent out an alert to our members and i actually took advantage of that and it ran you know over the course of about a year from a dollar 50 all the way up to almost you know four four fifty or so by 425 or so so that was a really nice year for for uh, natural gas so when it hits dollar fifty, you know it can stay there for a little bit, but it tends to bounce off of that area, as you can see from this clearly from this chart. So we got down to dollar fifty in twenty sixteen, and it rallied. We hit that area, lingered there a little longer with the uncertainty of COVID, but then it sure enough it came back up, uh, and now we recently fell off of a cliff from three fifty, you know, at the beginning of the year down yeah. to a dollar 50 you know what a brutal sell-off in, in uh, natural gas and sure enough it hit the dollar 50 and started rebounding again so no no guarantees of course it could continue to go even lower than a dollar 50 but at least we found a very cool multi-year support level for natural gas which bodes well i think you know for uh you know for that commodity yeah. Now, <clears throat> basically on this drawdown right here, all we've done is is put into our investing account, uh, Devon and uh, Equitable, you know, and, and that's it. But is there a way to trade this like with options or something like how would how would you run that? How'd you do it back in 2016? Well, I used at the time, I want to say it was UNG. I, I don't like these ETFs that track right. the commodities because of the contango and all of that. Now, there is um, there is an ETF that we use now with our ETF leaderboard, as I mentioned. So we track the, the trends in different ETFs. 
the one we use, the one we use to track natural gas now is um, the First Trust Natural Gas ETF. It mainly focuses upon, you know, natural gas producers, which serves as a pretty good proxy. Uh, that ticker is FCG. That's the one we track. In fact, I'll, uh, I have it right here. You can see what FCG looks like. And you can see how it came down to this area here, 2250. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, look at and that. It's been rallying nicely. Yeah. And, you know, UNG can also can also be good. Uh, but I don't even know if it's still around. I haven't even looked at that one in years. Yeah, that, it, it, that but it, it doesn't have the exaggerated moves. You know how like you can run options on SILJ or something right. and take advantage of that. The, the, the UNG doesn't really seem to have that. Yeah, c compare UNG here exactly. I mean, where it came down here and then what it went up a couple of bucks. And then, you know, whereas with, uh, you know, with uh, uh, FCG, uh, you know, it's just showing a nice rebound. Along oh, yeah, that's a perfect double Natural bottom gas. right there. I mean, what more do you want? Yeah, you know, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. that's the one we use. That's the one we track for our for our members. Yeah. OK. For natural gas. OK. Awesome. Um, yeah. And Bitcoin, you uh, have uh, uh, been a long term holder. We got our first Bitcoin, I think, in uh, 2014 or 2015. I don't remember. It was 450 bucks whenever that time frame was. So I, mm -hmm. I can appreciate the uh, early entry. Um, what uh, what do you see on Bitcoin lately? That thing is uh, just screaming <laughs> into the up. Uh, uh, there's a having event coming. What um, uh, what do you see with Bitcoin? Yeah, we we're very bullish on Bitcoin. Of course, we've been bullish from the very beginning. It's it's a market that I think is uh, it's it's still little understood. Um, it's still not very well understood. And I think the hard asset community, the hard asset investing community should be the ones who lead on this um and i know it's difficult because some of the folks in the hard asset community are if they can't hold it in their hand they're like it's not real you know and i understand this is computer code uh and I, it's a different kind of thing but i i was introduced to bitcoin many years ago uh it was in 2012 when i first heard of, or 2011 when i first heard about it. one of those from a guy by the name of trace mayer Mm -hmm. Trace uh, was guy. He, he's probably one of the very, very first early. He is super early adopter uh, of Bitcoin. Um, I I didn't jump aboard immediately. I was pretty hesitant. I was a little concerned about what it was. I was like, who put this out? Who's Satoshi Nakamoto? You know what? I was pretty suspicious. And so it took me several months to kind of really do my own due diligence with the little information I could get aside from the white paper. And I decided to take the plunge. The way we approach Bitcoin is just a dollar cost average. And we just do that on a regular basis. So we're pretty, uh, that, that leaves us pretty unsusceptible to the latest price moves. Doesn't really matter what's happening. And it's a long-term hold for us. I, to me, I'm, I'm in the camp and not, I realize not everybody is here. And that's okay. Everybody has their own opinion. But uh, I'm in the camp that believes we're going to see, you know, Bitcoin rise, you know, pretty dramatically. And I, and I, I hesitate to give prices, you know, because of course you could be wrong, but I, I'm of the opinion that it could go much, much higher than perhaps many people are realizing. And I think the same thing goes to a lesser extent for Ethereum. Uh, when you think about the recent uh, uh, spot Bitcoin ETF approval by the SEC, to me, this represents Bitcoin's IPO mo uh, moment. No one thinks that you are late to the game uh, whenever something IPOs, I mean, yeah. you know, it, it, the IPO is just kind of the very beginning of it. You might overpay at the IPO, but it doesn't mean that it's you're you're not early. You know, you're not early. So the IPO moment for Bitcoin, really, where Wall Street adopted it, was with this spot Bitcoin ETF, and we have seen them have voracious demand for it. Doesn't mean it'll continue every single day or every single month. I think we're in a cycle right now that bodes very well for Bitcoin, the four-year cycle, and I suspect that we will see. I believe we could see this price run higher, two steps forward, one step back, not straight up, uh, through you know the early, uh, the late summer, late summer of 2025. And so, now I don't invest in Bitcoin miners. I never have. I I think that uh, those can be wonderful speculation tools. I just tend to be, uh, you know, I'm not. I don't trade as much as I used to anymore. As life gets you know, as life as you know, as life moves on, and you have more children, and you have more responsibilities, and I mean, I, I'm living on a, you know, on, on a little, uh, 
uh, on a piece of land and I'm working it and, you know, have a garden and have chickens and, you know, have a lot, I'm, I'm homeschooling my children. So it's very difficult to get out there and speculate all the time, you know? Yeah. Uh, and so, but if I, if I did, I, I would probably look at, you know, crypto miners and say, this is a really great niche for trading, you know, but for me, I'm much more comfortable simply just to buy high quality assets on a regular basis, DCA, and then trade around those uh, positions as I have the time. Um, that's how I do it. But I'm very bullish on Bitcoin. I think that we have not seen uh, anything yet. I think that this is just the warm up phase. And in fact, let me show you one more chart related to Bitcoin that kind of proves that point. This is a ratio chart we've watched for years with our members. This is a really important chart. And you hmm. can really you can do this with anything. This is the Bitcoin and S&P 500 index ratio. And so this ratio, this ratio is really cool. So right now it takes um, 13 shares of the S&P 500 to buy one Bitcoin. Um, well, when it takes seven, that number seems to be the magic number that we've noticed going back for some time. So seven, I started noticing this chart back in 2015, 2016, and I started quantifying how much, you know, how much does it take uh, of S&P to, you know, actually you know, buy uh, one Bitcoin. And we noticed that back in the 2017, 2018 peak, it hit seven, it hit hmm. seven. And that, that was like the, the ceiling, you know, and then it was a crash, huge, massive yeah. crash. You remember the 2018 crash and it came down to like one, you know, <laughs> <It's> like, wow. <laughs> and, and so, and then it kind of came back up and then it came right back to that seven and then it smashed that. And then it did basically double. It did double of seven. It was uh, 14. Uh, and it came to 14 or even 15. Okay. And then it, then it peaked out. That was the peak, uh, as you can see right there, 14, 15. And then it came back down, it held seven and then it came back up and then it came back down and then lost seven. Okay. So seven was the number. And then we said, well, you know, if we get a convincing breakout above seven again, then it's, it's very likely that we could run and maybe even see this thing blow past the 14 and 15, maybe up to say 21 or 22. Well, that's our expectation now. And so now as we see that we recently got that breakout, that breakout, by the way, back in October, uh, above 7.0 on this ratio chart coincided, uh, Steve, with the, uh, with the really big uh, breakout for Bitcoin. And so Bitcoin now has been on this nice tear. And you can see now it's up to about 13. So it's almost up to where it was, say, back in 21, 22, uh, which makes sense because we're almost at that, you know, all time high. But uh uh, but uh, we, we expect that it's going to go well beyond this. Um, but anyway, that, that's, that is a really helpful chart that we've used over the years to try to track that market and, uh, and it served as well. Yeah, I, that is interesting. You know, I, I've got trading view and I've never plotted those two together, although I've plotted just about everything else against mm -hmm. the S and P 500. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to pull that one up. That's awesome. Um, okay. Uh, some just basic, um, uh, like when it comes to options, when it comes to trading, I mean, what I do is 90% of, of my investable assets are uh, in companies like Exxon, um, you know, uh, BHP, you know, these dividend uh, ones, you know, um, other ones that I, I plan on holding for like a year or more, right? And then the other 10% is what I do is I do uh, uh, trading, you know, shorter term swim trading less than uh, less than 12 months. And um, what kind of um, what's 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 my question, I guess, is like, what ratio would you recommend not exceeding on that? Is it like 70, 30, 80, 20, 90, 10? What 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 do you see? Let me make sure I understand the question. So you're, you're referring to the amount that you do, like long term investing versus trading. Exactly. OK, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because that's a great point, uh, Steve. Uh, many people don't know the difference. Um, and many people think in terms of once you learn how to trade, if you learn how to trade right, um, it becomes almost a way of thinking. You know, it becomes a way of thinking. And, and it, it, I often compare trading to uh, or, or long term investing, saying to getting married, you know, and then trading is just kind of, you know, out, you know, kind of on the market kind of thing. You know, you're just out there just kind of shopping or whatever. And so uh, you can kind of get stuck in that mentality of never really settling down with anything. And if you do that, if you if you don't invest and if you don't settle down with some high quality assets, then you're going to miss out 
on really a lot of things. And, you, and many people don't have that luxury. You know, we all have a certain amount of time and we need that time to compound. Uh, we need that in our favor. So you do need to have an investing strategy, uh, even if you're a trader. And so uh, the way I do it uh, is the, the my my rule of thumb overall is 70 to 75 percent long term investing uh, out of the money that I'm going to put into stocks. Now, let's make it clear uh, that I don't put 100 percent of my money into stocks. You know, out of all the money that I could invest, some of it goes into real estate. Real estate is my favorite asset class you know, by far. I mean, it's my absolute favorite. And so, you know, that that takes up not the majority of my investment, but it's the largest percentage of my investing. And then I have another, uh, you know, percentage set for hard assets. And I have another percentage of investment dollars that goes to my own business and another one that goes to stocks. Another one goes to crypto, you know. So so anyway, uh, of the amount that I allocate to stocks, just that particular allocation of that, the the dollars in that allocation, my rule of thumb is to trade no more than 25% of what's in that basket. Now, as I mentioned, because my life has become much more busy with, you know, uh, with, with, with my business and with my homeschooling, my children and with running, you know, all, all the things I do here at this property, you know, so uh, I don't have as much time to trade and, and that's okay. You know, I had plenty of time to trade earlier on and that's fine. Uh, I still like to trade a lot. I just don't trade as much as I used to. I don't have the time. And so right now, realistically, to me, it's a, it's more about 90% of my money uh, in that stock allocation is in long-term investments and about 10% I use to trade. And what I do is I trade around my core positions. So one of my one of my largest core positions uh, you know, is is the NASDAQ 100. That's that's a market that I've liked for years. I, I just like the NASDAQ 100. And so I like to trade around that. Uh, because in what I like about it is that sure you can use options on that too, but they really have some nice, uh, inverse ETFs and leveraged ETFs that you can trade around and amplify your gains in, in, uh, the NASDAQ 100. So that's what I, that's what I'll tend to do. That tends to be my, my personal trading niche these days. But, uh, yeah, I, I would say, you know, my personal is about 90 and 10, 10% trading, 90% long-term on my stock allocation. But I would, but I would say rule of thumb is I wouldn't want any more than 25%, even if I was actively trading in a, in my trading bucket. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Set up your retirement account early, let the dividends compound and, and grow and, uh, and yes. let it mature and then uh, have no more than 25% of your uh, short-term swing trade. Yep. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Because again, especially, and, and I would say that number needs to be smaller based upon how long you've been trading too. I mean, Again, if I had more time, I would trade more. But uh, if I was brand new, I wouldn't want to have more than, say, 10% because you're going to lose a lot of money when you're learning to trade. You know, Steve, you, you probably know that, too. I mean, when you learn to trade it, it, it you know, it, it certainly, you know, you pay your tuition on Wall Street, as I often say. I mean, you're, you're going to learn, you know, uh, and you're going to lose money as you do. So that's OK. But uh, you don't want to you don't want to burn through a lot of your money. So you got to be careful, you know. Yeah. And when you start out, it's in your, uh, one of your top 10 rules is uh, do a paper account and uh, learn, learn, learn the, uh, the mechanics of it. Because, you know, with every new software, you got to learn which buttons to click and you may have the wrong expiration date or something. You got to learn those yes. lessons while it's free <laughs> instead of learning yes. it when you're trading. Um, paper okay. trade. Well, how about paper uh, trade for sure? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. How about uh, bankroll management? So uh, I come from a, a gambling poker background, and that was, I think, one of the most obvious but most broken rules among the poker players was bankroll management, buying into a tournament or a game that their bankroll can't realistically uh, support. What uh, what bankroll management or some bank bankroll management 101 uh, can you give our viewers? Well, I think the first one begins with that allocation, which we just talked about. So just not putting, you know, not not uh, thinking in terms of, you know, I have my long term investment money can be used for trading. In other words, like quarantining that off and saying, I have this bucket of money to trade. And then once you have that amount that you've decided that you can trade and realize whatever money that you're going to trade. I know this may sound severe, but this is just after 25 plus years of trading and coaching people and, you know, seeing a lot of. You know, making a lot of mistakes and seeing people make mistakes, 
is that you just have to mentally prepare yourself that the money that you're going to trade could all be lost. Even though you're going to use stop losses and even though you're going to use money management rules, you still just want to view that money as money that you can afford to lose. This is not rent money. This is not your money that you're trying to compound for long term. This is money that you've earmarked specifically to speculate with. So if it all goes poof, you're not living under a bridge. That's the very first important point is to make sure that you're using money that you can afford to lose when you trade. Uh, secondly, uh, stop losses. Okay, so stop losses to me, uh, I don't really use stop losses in terms of long-term investments. In fact, quite frankly, whenever I invest in something long-term, I kind of hope, Steve, that it goes down because I, I, don't, I have a 20-plus year time horizon. I'd rather it go down and buy more than it go up. So kind yes. of perverse kind of perverse in that way. But with long-term investing, I don't really care. I'd rather it go down right now, to be honest, because I want to buy more. But when it comes to in trading, well, trading is entirely different. When you buy something as a trade, as a long trade, you're not expecting it to go down. And if it goes down, well, the worst possible thing that you can do, and let me stress this, the worst possible thing that you can do is throw more money at it. Because if it didn't, if it did not do what you thought it was going to do, well, then that's where people have to say, I made a mistake. I was wrong. And that's okay. And you lick your wounds and you move on. And the, 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 the thing that I've seen destroy the most trading accounts is averaging down despite the fact that you thought it was going to go up. So if you buy a stock and you think it's going to go up, obviously that's why you're buying it if you're going long, and it doesn't go up, well, you have to be able to say, I made a mistake. You got to be able to put down the pride and you got to say, I screwed up. I, this did not do what I thought it was going to do. That's okay. That happens every single day to traders. But the thing that the, the wise trader does is the wise trader cuts his losses when they're small, right? He cuts his losses and then he tries to figure out what did I mess up? What was my problem? What did I do wrong? That's what a good trader does. Uh, a, a trader on the way to the poorhouse is going to continue to take good money and throw it after bad, hoping that he'll one day be right. Okay. And we've all done that. Every I've done it. You've done it. Everybody's probably done it. But, it, but over time I realized I have to create a rule for myself that I will not do that, that I will average down on a long-term investment because I have 20 plus years, but on a trade, you know, on a short-term trade, I'm not going to throw more money, uh, more good money after bad. Uh, and so I think, uh, using stop losses, not lowering your stop losses, uh, should be uh, rules that we impose upon ourselves as traders. And then maybe one last rule uh, might be to never allow yourself to risk in terms of your stop loss, that the stop loss never equals more than, you know, one to 2% of your total trading capital. So, you know, if you have a 8% stop loss, say, below where you entered a stock well that amount uh, of whatever you're going to lose if you're wrong should not equal more than one to two percent max of your total trading balance preferably no more than one uh, percent so i would say position sizing is absolutely vital stop losses and never lowering stop losses uh, are vital and then just uh, and then avoiding the temptation to average down on trades, uh, understanding that it may be valid on investing, but it's just not valid on trades. Yeah, I like that, uh, especially the the one percent uh, max loss for each uh, trade. That goes right in line with poker. I mean, when I uh, was playing a lot of uh, poker tournaments, I wouldn't buy into a tournament uh, if it was more than one percent of my roll. The one exception I made on that is once a year, there were the best poker tournaments on the planet during the time in the World Series of Poker in Vegas. And then I would up it to uh, 2%. And if I wanted to get into a bigger tournament, then I would sell the rest of myself at a little bit of a premium so that I could buy into a tournament that was, uh, that was more than that. But yeah, that is key because there is some variance can be radical. <laughs> you know, you could place a lot of bets that are 70% uh, to hit and just get 30 every time. And, and there's, it's not something you could control. That's just luck. Uh, but yeah, I like that a lot. Okay. If um, you have a, a free gift for our listeners, if they go to 
uh, followthemoney.com. Uh, they can uh, put their email address and you will email them the top 10 trading rules. I like this a lot. I, uh, I read through it and I realized that I do, well, I don't paper trade anymore, but I did when I started. I, I've done nine out of 10. And the one that I'm embarrassed to admit that I haven't done, and I don't know why I did it with poker, is, is have a ledger. Have a ledger mm -hmm. of all your trades uh, so that you can track, like, maybe you just can't trade on Fridays for whatever reason. And if you don't write that down and start keeping uh, data of it, you're never going to know. Like, I don't think your subconscious is, is going to put that together without having a, uh, uh, whether you do it in a notebook or on an Excel spreadsheet or whatever. Um, I like this a lot, highly recommend it, and it's free. Um, so mm. there'll be a link down below for those that want to check it out. Um, what If listeners want to follow your work, um, how can they do so? And what can they expect if they sign up for your service? Yeah, well, first of all, as you mentioned, they can go to followthemoney.com. Um, and right there on the front page, if they just scroll down just a little bit, they'll see where they can enter their name and their uh, email address if they want. They, that'll put them on our email list and we will send them occasional ideas and updates, but they'll initially get uh, those free gifts. They'll get our top 10 trading rules. It's a nice special PDF report. As you had mentioned, I think it's filled with great information. We also going to send them a video uh, called the 12 lessons from the world's greatest stock traders. And so it's filled with great. This is a great video I did at a live summit we put on a few years ago. And I think it's really going to be beneficial for, uh, for your viewers there's a lot we can learn from historical traders. Then we also have our uh, memberships. And our memberships are just filled with trading and investing ideas, uh, our income university. We have a, a trend trading software. We teach trend trading here. So it's a, it's a really immersive thing. Uh, we also teach investing, provide investing ideas, ongoing week, weekly coaching calls. Uh, there's just a lot. So people can go to followthemoney.com and choose a plan that's right for them. Uh, and then I'm, all, and then I'm also, uh, as you had mentioned, hosting, uh, helping Steve Penny over at uh, uh, silver chartist as well. So that's been a really nice thing we've been doing in 2024. So yeah, all of those things, we've been doing a lot of great stuff and our, we, I have a heart of the teacher. So I really like to help people understand. I've learned a lot through the school of hard knocks. I feel like I have a lot to share and, uh, that's what I like to do. So. Awesome. Awesome. There will be a link in the pinned comment below. You can check it out. Uh, thank you, Jerry. This was a blast. Uh, I'd love to have you on the show again sometime. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate the opportunity. Yes. And thank you for always being here. Check out Jerry's show in the pinned comment below. He does a lot of explainer videos on YouTube as well. I found them helpful. Uh, also join us at Silver Chartist. Thank you for tuning in. Hit the like and subscribe and share this with anyone that you think needs to hear it. It's probably your buddy that can't stop talking about Eli Lilly. Have yourself a great rest of the day, and we will talk to you next time.